All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. If you're just joining us, go ahead and grab a pen and paper really quickly. Um, I've got a section in my presentation where I'm gonna ask you to write down a few things for me. Um, and I also wanna direct your attention to our chat. Um, so if you click on the chat, you should see that there's a link there. Um, you can go ahead and click on that link and let it open in another screen, but we're gonna ask that you do a review of our presentation at the end. We're always looking for more feedback and always looking to make updates to these presentations. So any feedback that you have will be extremely helpful. Um, but if, you, if you're just joining with us, I'm Amanda Turner. I am the sports dietitian with Children's Hospital Sports Medicine Center. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you today about healthy habits in the off season for improved performance. Um, I'm gonna be talking for about the first half of the hour and then one of our athletic trainers, Adrian Stewart, is going to be talking more on the movement side of things um, in the off season to keep you healthy and again, get you an edge as you get back in season. So we're gonna jump right in and get started here. And this is our, um, our five key areas we're gonna be talking about today that I'm gonna be discussing. Uh, we're gonna go through he building healthy habits for sleep, our best meal patterns, building nutrient density into our diet, uh, caffeine, should we have it, should we not? And then hydration, how much is enough? And sleep is, I know this is not a food topic, but sleep happens to impact all of the food decisions that we're making. And so I think it's really, really important for us to talk, touch on this, especially in off season, because I tend to see athletes who either are really dedicated to their sleep and they, they do a really great job of keeping consistent sleep patterns, um, or athletes who are really not very great at getting enough sleep in on a regular basis. So if you fall on that latter side, um, we're gonna go through some tips to help you improve your sleep. So the importance of sleep, it helps to improve focus and energy during your sport. Um, it's necessary for muscle recovery and it helps to lower the stress hormone cortisol. Now, cortisol is one of those fight or flight hormones. We want that to be active when you steal the ball and you're running down the field or you're getting ready to do a pass on the floor. Um, that's when we really wanna see that cortisol level uh, elevated. But when you wake up in the morning, we want that to go back down to its normal level. And if you're not getting adequate sleep, that's not going to happen. Um, sleep from a food standpoint, the reason I bring sleep up first is that we have research showing that if we're not getting enough sleep, um, it, it impacts our hunger and fullness hormones in a negative way. So getting uh, less than the amount of sleep that is recommended on a daily basis actually elevates your hunger throughout the day so you feel more hungry and it lessens how satisfied you feel with meals so you feel less full. So it kind of puts you in this position of wanting to eat more consistently throughout the day. So you may eat more than your body actually needs. And I don't know about you, but personally, when I don't get enough sleep, I want things like caffeine and sugar that help me stay awake and feel more awake throughout the day. Um, so it's hard to get a nutrient dense diet if we are not getting adequate amounts of sleep during the day. Um, so I, I put this in here because it has been a super strange year for most of us. So if your sleep has been off, if you've been on your phone more than usual or on a computer more than usual, uh, if your schedule is inconsistent and if you're tired all the time, um, those could be signs that you're not getting enough sleep. Um, so the quality of our sleep is really going to drive that other behavior that we're, we're wanting to improve. So what are our goals that we're shooting for? So um, ideally anyone between the ages of six and 12, we want nine to 12 hours of sleep a night. Anyone 13 to 18, we want eight to 10 hours of sleep a night. Um, this is really for kind of your average individual. So when you're in season, you might actually need towards the high end of these numbers or more than you do in the off season, just because your body's trying to recover more. Um, but some, some, some tips in order to help you achieve these goals, we want to stick to a consistent bedtime schedule. So sleep habits largely revolve around our habits. So if you have a consistent bedtime at 12 p.m. or 1 a.m., you probably don't start to feel tired until that time. That's because our body builds on the habits that we already have. So if you're wanting to change that bedtime to more of a 10 p.m. bedtime, it's going to take consistency in, you know, starting to wind down and getting into bed at 10. You're not going to feel tired the first few nights, but the more consistent you are with getting into bed at that time and getting up at that earlier time, um, the more your body will start to adhere to that new schedule. We want to make the bedroom quiet, dark, and at a comfortable temperature. 
So if your, your house is warmer or cooler than what you feel comfortable in, maybe a small space heater or a fan, those could be really helpful things in the bedroom for you. No technology devices in the bedroom. And I feel pretty strongly about this one. So especially cell phones, iPads, computers, those are not things that you should be using while you're in your bed. Um, ideally, you would put those in a place outside the room before you're going to bed so that you can truly just wind down and not worry about your phone dinging or buzzing um, and you know keeping you up throughout the night. Avoid caffeine after 2 p.m. We're gonna talk about this more, but that can impact your sleep. Um, and then ideally we would eat dinner about an hour or more before bedtime. So I know when you're in season, especially if, if you have late games, late competition, it can be hard to stick with this hour before bed rule, especially if you're not getting home until nine or 10 o'clock at night. Um, however, in the off season, when we have a little bit more control over our schedules, theoretically, um, hopefully you can put this practice into place at this time. But I wanna say too, if you're in, in season and you're getting out late, and you just finished a competition and you're getting ready to go to bed, you should still eat something after competition. That's an important place to eat. You shouldn't go to bed hungry. Um, so we can talk more on that. That's kind of another talk. But for now in the off season, um, about an hour before bed is when we wanna finish dinner. So here's what a sample sleep schedule would look like. Um, let's say at nine o'clock, we're gonna silence our phone and put it in whatever our bedtime location is. So maybe that's in, um, an outlet outside your bedroom so it can charge and still be your alarm, but it's not in the bedroom with you. Um, maybe it's going to be, maybe everybody put in the family puts their phone in a bucket at night so that nobody's disturbed at night. Whatever you want that to look like, but it shouldn't be in the bedroom with you. At nine o'clock, you would start completing your bedtime routine. Wash your face, brush your teeth, read a book, whatever that looks like for you. At 9.45, we want to start getting your room ready. So close the blinds, close the shades, make it as dark as possible, turn off any electronics. Maybe if you do, I don't know if people still have these, but if you have an electronic clock that has a red or blue um, numbers on it, turning that around or covering it up, that can actually have a really um, positive impact on your sleep too. So you might see if there's anything like that in your room. Um, so that gives us plenty of time. So by 10 p.m., we are actually in bed, covered up in the sheets, have our eyes closed. Um, and that prepares us for a 7 a.m. wake up time. So again, if you're in the 16 year old range, that gives you that eight hours of sleep or sorry, nine hours of sleep that we're looking for. Okay, so this would be an ideal schedule. If you are way off from this current schedule, you may, you may need to take it in, um, in chunks in order to get there. So if you currently go to bed at 1 a.m., and this can be the actual time you're going to bed, not the time your parents think you're going to bed too, so if it is 1 a.m., then getting to bed by midnight, then getting to bed by 11 p.m., taking those little steps to kind of slowly rewind your bedtime, um, it will help you get there. But again, we want to get this in place so that once the season starts back up again, your body is well rested. It knows what it feels like to be well rested. And then you're going to be in this pattern so that um, as you're playing, you're already going to have this really nice circadian rhythm that you'll fall into and hopefully recover faster when the season comes. So now that we've got sleep uh, worked out, we're gonna go into meal patterns next. Um, and this is probably my second biggest pet peeve with my athletes. Athletes need three meals and a minimum of one snack every day. Some athletes need closer to three snacks, but at least three meals and one snack, even when you're not in season. That's really important, okay? So we wanna focus on getting in carbohydrate, protein, and color at every single meal. Those are like the easiest things to remember when it comes to your, your meal components. Um, zucchini noodles and cauliflower rice have been really popular lately. Cauliflower pizza would fall into that cauliflower rice column. Those count as color, not as carbohydrate. Regular noodles like um, wheat pasta noodles, uh, rice noodles, or regular rice, those would all count as carbohydrates but these are vegetables, they count as color. So in our example that we have here, uh, we've got our yogurt and chia seeds, and then the pumpkin seeds, those count as protein. We've got our granola, which is our carb, and then we have our berries, um, I think that's acai in there, and then cherry mixture, that's our color component. So this would be a really good example for maybe a breakfast um, or maybe a bigger snack if you've been active. Uh, this is a really good uh, dis distribution. So the reason I'm focusing on meal patterns is that we have researched what different meal patterns can do for your body. 
The first one that was researched is this kind of snacker pattern where this person, this athlete would eat like eight times a day. This is the person that you see that kind of is always eating something. Um, they're getting about 10 grams of protein every single time they snack. So in total, they're getting 80 grams of protein for the day. Let's say that that is, that's correct for them, but they're eating eight different times, really small meals. So we compared this eating pattern to the blue lines, which is our uh, kind of breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack pattern. Um, this person eats four times a day, about every three hours, but they get a little bit more protein per meal. So they're getting bigger meals that are about 20 grams of protein each compared to those, those small meals with only 10 grams of protein. Total amount of protein for the day is the same though, still 80 grams of protein. And then the last meal pattern we compared it to uh, was a two meal a day pattern. So this person eats two big meals, a big lunch and a big dinner. Um, they're still getting 80 grams of protein, so 40 grams at each. Um, but after they have dinner, they're going a pretty long time until they have lunch again. So the purpose of this study was to really look at what type of eating patterns do we get the most muscle recovery, strength gains, and lean gains or muscle gains out of? If you want to guess which one it was, I kind of already gave you the answer. Uh, it's eating every three hours. So the blue pattern where we have about 20 grams of protein spread out throughout the day, um, it gives us more opportunity to absorb and incorporate that protein into our muscles our tendons, our ligaments, our bones. Um, so we've seen that just having that threshold of protein, that amount throughout the day is really important. Um, now let's say you're in season or you're just active and growing or you're really tall and you need more snacks than just one snack, that's okay. We still wanna maintain this core pattern where we've got a decent amount of protein coming in four times a day. And then you can add on a couple other snacks that are maybe lower in protein. But it's really important to make sure that we maintain that core four times eating a day at minimum. Um, so I wanted to give out these plates so that you could see kind of how your eating pattern should be different from in-season versus off-season. Um, this is a higher activity pattern. And I know some of my athletes actually get more active in the off-season. I see that a lot with my gymnasts. Um, but if you're not more active in the off-season, this is going to be your, your in-season plan. So when we are more active, uh, we need more carbohydrates. Our carbohydrates on this is our grain and our fruit. Um, so that piece would cover about half of your plate. Protein would cover about a quarter of your plate or it's about palm size portion. And then your veggies would be about a fist portion size or about a quarter of your plate there. Um, so again, more food and especially more carbohydrates when we are more active. So I want that to kind of be the pattern in your head here. Now, when we're less active, so let's say you're off season, I'm a runner. So when I go into off season, I am definitely less active than when I'm training for a race. So if your activity goes down, our goal in off season, if we're not as active is to really maintain our protein intake. So I see a lot of athletes who um, their hunger goes way down when they're not training as much. And so they just cut back on a lot of their foods, but a lot of their protein foods they cut back on. So maybe they stop drinking as much milk or they're not eating as many eggs, or they've cut back on their meats or cut it out completely. Um, those are all things that we still wanna maintain that good amount of protein. It's really the carbohydrates that will shrink down a little bit. So um, our grains you'll see here only cover a quarter of our plate, and then our fruits and veggies will be about half of our plate. So fruits and vegetables actually go up when we're in the off season, we need more of those things. Um, so I think that's where a lot of athletes kind of miss out is we're not getting more of those fruits and veggies in, in the off season. Um, and that can just kind of skew our proportion of, of nutrients. So I wanted to give you a couple meal schedule examples. So this first one is, let's say this is a weekend, we're getting up a little bit later at 9.30 or 10. So we're gonna have breakfast around that time. Lunch maybe at one, a snack maybe about four and dinner a little bit later around seven. This is your really good example for three meals and one snack a day. Um, I did want to mention that if you do have a habit of skipping meals, so let's say you're not great at eating breakfast or you get busy in the middle of the day, so you just miss lunch or miss your snack often, um, plan what you're going to eat at those times. So if you need something easy or something that's not very filling because you're not super hungry at breakfast time, plan to have a small protein bar or plan to have um, even a glass of milk can work as a breakfast option. Um, any of those are really good choices. 
and then set a reminder to eat. Um, you know, if you tend to be out and about and, or playing or, you know, out in the yard with your friends or whatever that looks like, set an alarm to go off at 12 or one, just to remind you to run in quickly and grab a PB and J sandwich even um, just to get something in. We want to create those meal patterns so that again, once we get back into season, you already have these standards set up and your body's going to be accustomed to that. So then your body's going to tell you, hey, I'm hungry. It's one o'clock. This is when we normally eat. Um, and you'll already be used to that pattern. So it's going to make you a better athlete because you're going to have better fueling patterns long term. So here's another example for maybe an earlier riser or maybe a school day, for example. This has two snacks in it. A little earlier dinner time here. And so if you were still hungry after that or you had an especially active day, we might add a snack at 9 p.m. But I wanted to give you a couple of different scenarios to look at what this might look like um, to hopefully adjust yours so that uh, it's something that you can stick with. Okay, uh, sample meals, I'm not going to talk through this in depth. Uh, you will get a copy of this presentation from my colleague. So you can look through these breakfast, lunch, and dinner options. And then I also have some uh, great snack options on here as well. So don't stress, you're gonna get those uh, later on too. And if you have trouble getting those, I have my email at the end. If for some reason you don't get them, just reach out to me and I can share those directly. So we're moving next into nutrient density. So if you haven't heard the term nutrient density before, um, that is the uh, amount of nutrients that's found in a particular food. Um, so foods that are nutrient dense have a pretty high level of nutrition. They give us lots of vitamins and minerals or a lot of a specific vitamin and mineral. So I want you to think in your head what those foods that fall into this category might be. Give you a second. And if you're thinking of things like fruits and vegetables and whole grains and nuts or anything that's listed on this slide, all of those would be considered nutrient dense foods. The opposite of these foods uh, would be our low nutrient density foods. So they don't contain a lot of nutrients. So that would be the opposite of these foods. So snack foods, chips, snack cakes, uh, deep fried foods, those would all fall into a low nutrient density category. It's not that we can't have those foods. We just want to focus on getting in these really nutrient dense ones on a regular basis. And then we can sprinkle in our favorite foods um, here and there based on what, what meals we're having. So when we're building a nutrient dense plan, uh, these are the goals that we have to make sure we're getting good nutrition in the off season. And again, our whole goal is let's build great habits in the off season so that when we get in season, those will stay and we don't have to think as hard about those. So we're gonna eat protein with each meal. I don't care if it's eggs or dairy products or edamame or meat or fish, whatever it is that you like, we need to have some type of protein source present with each meal. Uh, choose whole grains half of the time. So that includes brown rice, whole wheat pasta, whole wheat bread. Um, if you have like a black bean pasta, that would also count. Um, quinoa would count there. Amaranth, if you get into some of these other grains, uh, all of those are really great sources. Potatoes actually count there as well. I like the, the baked type better than the deep fried type, um, but there's definitely a place for the deep fried ones on occasion as well. Fruits and veggies. This is one that I really find my athletes often don't get enough of. Three to five cups, a cup's about a fist size of fruits and veggies every single day. If that seems like a lot to you and you're like, oh boy, I'm nowhere near that amount, start with even just getting one or two pieces of fruit every single day and set that as your goal. Um, the, the plant components that are found in fruits and vegetables have specifically shown to reduce inflammation or reduce damage to the muscle after activity. So it helps us recover faster and potentially with less muscle pain too. So if you tend to get really sore at the beginning of the season, our, our hope is that by adding in more fruits and vegetables in off season and then maintaining that as you start training, you'll, you'll recover faster and you'll be less sore as you're first getting into your sport. So that's a really good thing, right? Shooting for three to four servings of dairy daily or some type of dairy alternative where we're getting calcium and vitamin D and then nuts a few times a week. Nuts are a, a nutrient that, or a food group that I feel like um, a lot of athletes overlook often. They're super high in magnesium. They're really high in healthy fats and fiber. Uh, so they're a great thing to incorporate in. Even if that's like a natural peanut butter or almond butter, that would work just as well as whole nuts. 
So here's the writing it down piece. So I want you to write down your five favorite fruits and vegetables on that piece of paper that you have with you. So five favorite fruits and veggies. If you're like, oh gosh, I can only think of carrots and apples, I made a list for you so that you have a cheat sheet. If you don't have five that you can think of at the moment, we have some work to do. So one of your goals could be that in the off season, you're gonna work on trying some of these fruits and veggies that are listed on the page so that you can work your way up to five different things that you like. Now, if you only like carrots or bananas or apples, and I want you to get three to five cups of these fruits and veggies every day, you're gonna get super sick of carrots, bananas, and apples. So I want you to have more variety in the types of foods that you'll choose, but we need to try them and we have to be open to trying them at least five times generally uh, before we decide whether we like them or not. So if you've never tried jicama, jicama is one of my favorite ones. Um, it's, it's kind of sweet, but crunchy at the same time. Uh, you can put spices on it, you can bake it, uh, you can eat it raw. It's, I think it's a really nice uh, veggie to try um, or fruit, sorry to try. Actually, I think I have it listed under the veggie category, but it can go in both directions. Um, if you haven't tried that before, try it and see what you think of it. It's a really funky looking um, item at the store. It's like a brown color, uh, but it's, it's one that you should try and just see if you like it. So if you haven't tried most of the things on this list, I will tell you I'm not familiar with everything that's on this list. Um, so get creative at the grocery store, try something new, um, see if you can add that into your five favorite fruits and veggies. And then share this list with your parents so that they know what things you're excited to eat so that they can buy more of those things too. And then you really have no excuse for getting the fruits and veggies in at that point. All right, our last topic that we're running through today is hydration and caffeine. So I lump these two together because they kind of play off of each other. Uh, we're gonna start with the hydration side. So from a hydration standpoint, um, water is an essential nutrient. We need water for uh, temperature control in our bodies. That's really important for athletes because as your core temperature rises with your extended activity, um, if your core temperature goes up too high, that starts to reduce how much output you have or how hard you can work during your activity. So we wanna have plenty of fluid on board so that we can keep that body temperature regulated well. Water also delivers nutrition to the muscles and to the working tissue, which is, you know, you have to have oxygen coming to the muscles. And if we don't have enough iron and enough water in our blood to deliver that, you're going to feel more fatigued. Um, and then water also helps to remove waste. So lactic acid buildup with exercise and other waste products that are a product of exercise that will be removed um, with water as well. I will say most of the athletes that I see are under hydrated, maybe not dehydrated, but they're not maximally hydrated. Um, so what's going to count as your fluid intake? Water, milk, tea, and 100% juice, those will all count towards your fluid intake. Uh, we want to limit sodas. We want to limit sweetened coffee drinks and sports drinks. Sports drinks are for sport only. So when we've got sports happening for longer than about an hour 15, hour and a half, that's when sports drinks are appropriate. Um, it's not an appropriate lunch beverage or dinner beverage, really at any time, to be honest, unless you're again, really poorly hydrated, and we can fix that problem. So those are things that can still count as your fluid intake, uh, but we just want to use them in a little bit more moderation. And then we want to avoid energy drinks, definitely. So energy drinks, I think I have it here, or I don't have it on the next slide. Um, energy drinks are actually classified as a supplement in the U.S. They're not classified as a food, uh, whereas like sodas or coffee drinks, those are classified as a food. The problem with energy drinks being classified as a supplement is that it's not regulated here in the US. So all of our supplements that come in bottles, um, there's no specific mandates on those supplements that says, um, you know, a certain company has to look at it first before they're able to put it on the market to make sure it's safe and effective. We don't have anything like that. Uh, so the problem with energy drinks is that even though on the label it may say, oh, this is only 150 milligrams of caffeine, or oh, this has B vitamins in it. We don't know if that information on the label is true and has been verified. So it's important to make sure that you are, I, I recommend that all athletes are just avoiding energy drinks because I think that 
the risk for uh, getting over caffeinated or overdose on other stimulant type of herbal substances is way too high and it causes heart palpitations, high blood pressure, um, and can take you out of your sport or, or worse. Um, so I don't recommend doing those ever, really. If you need a little bit of caffeine, we can get it from other, other food sources instead. Um, so how much water is enough water on a regular basis or how much fluid? So on a minimum, when you are not active, we need half of your body weight in ounces for fluid. So in the middle of my chart here, if you weigh 140 pounds, we would need about 70 ounces of fluid on a day you do not exercise in order to be taking in enough fluid. So this is what I mean when I say my athletes are underhydrated is that a lot of athletes I see are meeting these guidelines, but they're also exercising on those days. When you exercise, um, we're losing anywhere from 10 to an extra 30 ounces per hour of practice. Um, you know, so for a high school male athlete who's wearing pads in a football practice on a hot day, you're probably going to lose closer to that higher side and need a lot of extra fluid. Um, whereas my younger, let's say 10 to 12 year old athlete um, who's playing a shorter soccer game on, in a cooler weather, maybe they're going to only lose on the lower end of that. But the biggest thing is to make sure that you're getting at least that minimum in and then adding more fluids for the exercise that you're, you're performing. Um, on the left-hand side here, this is a urine color chart. If you've seen me talk before, I know you've seen this chart before. Um, the top three, one, two, three, those are hydrated colors of urine. Anything at four or below that is dehydrated. Um, when you wake up in the morning, it's really normal for you to be at like a four or maybe a five because you've been fasting all night, you've been sleeping. So you're probably a little bit underhydrated. Um, but then hopefully after you've had breakfast and drank some in the morning, the next time you use the bathroom, you're at that three or higher. Um, this is the best way to tell you're hydrated, to be perfectly honest. So if you finish pack practice and your urine is like a six or a seven color, you are not drinking enough throughout the day. We need to work on getting you more hydrated. Um, if you also can go several hours, like four to six hours without using the bathroom during the day, you are also underhydrated. Um, ideally, we would need to use the bathroom about every two hours, and that indicates good hydration. So if you're going every 30 minutes or hour, we're probably drinking too much at one time or, or drinking too much in general. And so we can probably pull back on fluids at that time. Um, but if it's about every two hours, that's a normal bathroom schedule to have as long as it's in that like pale yellow post-it note color range. Um, so that's something that you can easily pay attention to every time you go to the bathroom. So when we're building hydration habits, because our whole goal is to make sure that we are um, improving your fluids again in the off season so that when you get in season, your body tells you when you're thirsty and you can listen to it and you've got the means to be able to drink more water. I will say as a caveat too, uh, with COVID, it's harder for all of us to get in more water. So I think it takes even more dedication, especially if you're in school in person um, or if you've got a job where you're wearing a mask all day. Um, I've struggled with it as well. So planning to take those short breaks and drinking more water on those breaks um, where you're away from people and you can take your mask off, um, that's, it's a really hard habit to, to do, but it's really, really important to make sure we're working on. So get a favorite water bottle, maybe one that tracks how much water you drink. There's one, I know there's an electronic one that will count how many times you filled it up for the day. Um, so that will help you stay on track with hydration. Always have fluids with you, even if you're just running errands. If you're hopping in your house to go visit your friend for 10 minutes, but then that turns into two hours and you didn't bring anything with you, uh, you're going to be underhydrated by the end of that. So just bring your water bottle with you and get in that habit. Um, set an alarm on your phone, maybe to remember to drink up, especially if you're really bad at drinking enough throughout the day, and then set a goal on how much water to drink throughout the day. And again, I, as far as goals go, use these numbers as your starting goals. Um, but if you find that you're drinking this amount and you still can go about four hours without going to the bathroom, you probably need more fluid than that. So that's when we can start to increase how much fluid you're drinking. Okay. Okay, caffeine. So how does caffeine work with our hydration? Um, caffeine, caffeinated beverages can count as part of your fluid for the day. So we talked about coffee and tea. Those can count as part of your hydration mechanisms. Um, however, there are some things to consider with caffeine. Caffeine can create dependence. So if you're used to having caffeine every single day, 
I, a lot of us know this, myself included, um, you need that caffeine to feel awake, right? It stimulates your central nervous system and wakes you up in the morning. Um, so if you're used to having it, it's, your body's going to become reliant on that in order to function um, on a daily basis. It will negatively impact your sleep. Caffeine has what's called a half-life of about six hours. So if you have um, a coffee at 3 p.m., six hours after that, nine o'clock, uh, it's still going to be in your body and can negatively impact your sleep. So that's why we say if you are going to have some caffeine, don't have it after two o'clock. It can improve athletic performance if it's taken in small doses at specific times and you don't have a tolerance to it. So I'm more of the persuasion of keep caffeine uh, relatively low on a daily basis and then time it so that you can have a little bit before a big competition so that you might feel a little bit of that caffeine um, effect where it makes exercise feel a little easier. It makes you be able to work a little bit harder um, during that exercise. But also know it can speed up the GI tract too. So uh, for specifically sensitive populations, it may, need, may make you need to use the bathroom, number two. Uh, and if you are in that camp, you may not want to take it before exercise. And then excess consumption, uh, as I mentioned earlier, can cause heart palpitations, elevated blood pressure, and irritability, which is why we're avoiding these guys over here on the left. So what's recommended is 100 milligrams or less per day for teens. Um, if you're younger than 13, we really don't recommend having caffeine on any basis. Um, but if you are in that teenage um, years, then up to 100 milligrams a day is allowed. Um, again, using food sources and avoiding supplements that aren't regulated. So how much caffeine is in different food products that we have here? So I've got a bunch of different things. Um, green tea is one of your lowest at about 10 milligrams per six ounce cup. The cups that you're getting from Starbucks are a lot larger than six ounces, so you'd need to multiply that uh, times how many ounces you're getting. Uh, black tea, dark chocolate, and soda you'll see there are all pretty moderate, so about that 50 milligrams of caffeine, and same with a Starbucks refresher. Where it goes way up, uh, a Starbucks coffee is almost 250 milligrams of caffeine. That is a lot, in, and that's a tall. If you get a larger than a tall coffee, you're getting even more caffeine than that. If you brew coffee at home, it's usually right around 100 to 120 milligrams. You can see your five hour energy, um, Zip Fizz, these type of supplements, um, five hour energy is closer to a Starbucks coffee and then your Zip Fizz is about 100 milligrams there. Um, so again, I would recommend staying away from these on a daily basis so that you don't get accustomed to having them and dependent on them. Um, and then if your stomach tolerates them okay, we would test that out with a practice or two. Um, you could uh, try taking about 100 milligrams of caffeine. So maybe, uh, you know, 12 ounces of black tea. So a tall black tea from Starbucks even. That would be uh, acceptable for about an hour before your exercise to give you that little performance boost. Um, but we would really only do that during like big competitions. We wouldn't even do that on a regular basis for practice because again, that creates dependence on these things. Um, so I'm hoping this makes sense and I will open it up for questions as we get to the end here. So for, uh, just in summary with habit building, I want you to pick the habit that seems easiest out of those five that we just talked about. And I want you to work on mastering that over the next two weeks. So if you heard what I said about the fruits and veggies and you're like, okay, I'm really going to dedicate myself to getting fruits and vegetables down before next school year. Um, you're, for these next two weeks, you're really going to focus on getting two pieces of fruit in or two vegetables in every single day. Once you're good in that habit, then we add on another habit. This is called habit um, stacking. Uh, we'll add on another habit, work on that for two weeks. So maybe you're going to work on getting nuts in a couple times a week. And we're going to work on another habit. So maybe we're going to cut out the caffeine at that point and we're going to save it so that we can actually see some performance benefits from it on down the road. Um, but you don't have to make all of these changes at one time. If you pick one and focus on one every two weeks, then over the course of 10 to 12 weeks, you're going to have all five of those habits in your nutrition. Um, and then hopefully we'll be in a really good spot as the season is getting started back up. Okay. So our ultimate goal is again, improving these nutrition habits, um, making them really strong in the off season now so that as practices and games start back up again, um, you've got them in place, your body's going to be ready for that nutrition and you're gonna recover faster and get stronger at your sport.
Okay, that is it for my side of the presentation. Um, if you have questions from the presentation, the sports nutrition at childrenscolorado.org is where you can reach me. Um, if you want to schedule a nutrition consult, uh, you need to talk about something that you've been struggling with nutritionally, that is the phone number that you can reach me to schedule. And again, you'll receive all of this information as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here and then turn it over to our athletic trainer, Adrian, who is going to uh, get you on the exercise side. And then we'll answer questions at the end as well. Great. Thanks, Amanda. So as Amanda said, I'm Adrian Stewart. I'm an athletic trainer with Children's Hospital. I'm currently working at Mountain Range High School. So I'm going to talk to you guys today more about uh, the movement component of what we should be doing with our bodies um, and conditioning in the off season. So now we know how to fuel ourselves correctly. Thank you, Amanda. That was great. And stay hydrated to increase our performance. So now it's like, what types of movements can we be doing um, to enhance our performance as well? So a lot of times people get a little bit confused as to what activity we should be doing in off season. Um, we don't actually have to be practicing our sport to improve our body movement mechanics and get better at our sports, become better athletes and prevent injuries. So staying active during this time is super important, um, but we're gonna touch on some like activation and mobility things that you can be doing. And these are things that you can do safely and effectively at home. You don't have to be under guidance of a coach or anything like that, which is great, especially um, now being at home during school time. So uh, it's really good to allow yourself some time to rest away mentally from the sport to prevent, prevent burnout, but also for your body to rest. So we are doing a lot of repetitive movements in sports. So let's say you're an overhead athlete, like a baseball player, a volleyball player. During this time, we wanna be working on the muscles that help us be stronger at those movements, but we don't need to be throwing a ton of pitches or throwing a ball overhead or doing overhead movements. This is a great time to get outside, go for a hike with a friend, go running, Try playing soccer if you're an overhead athlete, doing something where you're still staying active, you're moving your body, but you're allowing um, the, repeti the repetition of your upper body to relax. So what is the off-season program emphasis and what can you be doing at home now? So we can be working on our mechanics and movement patterns. So we can be building muscle with our own body weight. We can be building muscle with resistance bands and just simple things at home. So why do we wanna do these things? So our body movement and mechanics is critical into making us better athletes, right? So if we, I'm moving efficiently and effectively, I can get, become more powerful, faster, stronger, all of those things. Proper programming from a strength coach is great if you are, have access to that, but if you don't, you can still be doing these things on your own. Um, so we're going to go over some mobility and activation, but what is exactly activation? Um, some of you might be wondering. So these exercises are movements that you're doing to help prepare your, move, your nervous system for a bigger movement. So this could be something like as simple as a glute bridge to activate your glutes to prepare you to then do your movement in sport. That more dynamic, powerful speed movement. So essentially it's helping turn your muscle on and train muscle memory. So this is gonna help increase your range of motion, help improve your form and mechanics. So we wanna train that muscle memory similar to, the, so it, it turns on in our activities of daily living. So if I'm correctly firing my glutes and hips and core, I'm going to get out, out of my chair more effectively. I'm gonna run up and down the stairs more effectively. And that is training and practicing your muscle memory, just like you don't think about getting up in the morning to brush your teeth. It's just something that your body is used to doing. So we can do the same thing with our muscles in our everyday movements that's transferable into sport. So that again is going to make us more mechanically efficient and better at our sport. And then again, at less risk of injury. So a couple of the exercises that I'm gonna start with um, that are simple and safe at home. So I will say um, form is very important. We wanna make sure that we're activating the correct muscle when doing these instead of further perpetuating poor movements. So there's tons of free content that you can look at if um, you don't watch this presentation over and over again and watch me do it. Um, there's a ton of free movements, uh, videos on YouTube. We have some, links on our sports medicine page through Children's Hospital that has handouts of different exercises and so forth if you just need a little bit of reinforcement on those. It's also very easy in, to get a hold of a resistance band if you don't have equipment at home. You don't need, uh, you don't need anything fancy. You don't need dumbbells. Um, I would recommend some mini bands that you can get on Amazon or any of your sporting goods stores. 
your athletic trainer will thank you if you purchase one of these on your own and are doing these exercises. Um, and you will hopefully you will have to see us less because you won't be hurt as often. So I'm going to start with hips and glutes. These are some easy and again, safer ones to do at home. Um, give me two seconds and I'm gonna take the background off so you can see the movement that I'm doing. So our first one, I'm going for hips and glutes. I'm gonna start with hip bridges. We're gonna go down on the mat over here. So you don't need a mat. You can do it on the floor. You can do it on a sweatshirt or a towel, whatever, it doesn't matter. I just recommend that you don't do this on a soft surface. You don't wanna do this on your bed or anything like that because then you're not getting, um, you're probably not going to activate as uh, effectively. So this one, you'll lay flat. You're going to have your heels shoulder width apart. Can you see me? I'll spin. There we go. Feet shoulder width apart. And you're going to have your arms flat on the ground, okay? So you want to inhale. You're going to push through those heels and drive your pelvis up off the ground with your spine in neutral until you're in a straight line with your body. You're going to squeeze those glutes nice and tight like you're squeezing a dollar bill. Hold for two seconds and then slowly come back down. You'll drive back up through those heels neutral pelvis and come back down. So each of these movements that I'm gonna show you today, you would start about 10 to 15 reps. If 10 is difficult and you're starting to fatigue, then that's when we want to stop. You can increase your reps as things start to get easier and add resistance and so forth. The second one I'm gonna show you guys is banded monster walks. So this is the mini band that I was talking about. They come with different resistances. Start wherever you're comfortable, maybe get a pack of three, start with the easier one. So for this one, we're gonna bring the band up right above the knees. And I encourage you to stand up and work through these with me if you want. So then it'll help you um, set up better for questions if you feel something that feels funky or have any, uh, want some further clarification. So hip hinge is always important for our lower body exercises, just like you're sitting back into a chair first. So you're gonna hinge at those hips and you're going to move with a lateral step. So I'm gonna to walk towards you just so you see my feet a little bit better. So hip hinge. Uh, heels, knees, shoulder width apart, and you're going to take a step to the right. That back foot is going to follow and come forward. That's one step. Then you're going to step to the left, right and forward. You should feel this around your glute knee, the side of your leg should be burning a little bit. So we're gonna do 10 of these forward, and then you'll also go backwards. I strongly encourage you to stay in this hip hinge position the entire time that you're doing the movement. If you're fatiguing pretty quickly, you can stand up at the end of movement, take a quick break and keep going. But again, try to increase your resistance and reps and sets as you start to get easier. Uh, the last one, I'll oh, actually, sorry, leave the band on. So you can do a number of different squats. Again, if you want to get more dynamic, change the types of exercises, there's a lot of content. You don't have to just do a normal squat. Uh, but we'll do a normal squat. So again, hip hinge, you're going to come down to 90 degrees or lower. If you have that correct range of motion, core activation, tight trunk, squeeze the belly button in. You want to push with your knees like you're trying to push that band apart as you stand up. As you stand up, it's really important to get that isometric glute activation squeeze and then come back down. We can also turn this into a sumo squat, which would be feet a little bit further than shoulder width apart with your toes pointed out. Same thing, pushing that band apart coming back up. So those are three easy, safe movements for hips and glutes. So now I'm gonna show you guys some core movements, core and back, which is also really important things to be activating. So the first one that we're gonna do is a dead bug. So again, on our mat, laying flat, we're gonna bring arms up and knees up to 90 degrees. So the idea with this movement is to be able to turn, go opposite arm, opposite leg at the same time while maintaining a tight core without letting that low back come off the ground. So we're gonna take right arm, left arm, extend while keeping that core tight and switch. That's one rep. So that's a dead bug. Our next one is called a bird dog. We have funny names, but this one's a little bit harder and you might need some, to use some other tools for reinforcement on your form, which I'll explain. So you wanna make sure that your joints are stacked. So those shoulders need to be safely above your elbows and your wrists. 
This is called a quadruped position. So you wanna be nice and neutral on the spine and flat. So if you need to start just to get used to the movement, just raising one arm off the ground and coming back down without tilting the pelvis is the key. So we don't want any rotation like this. Sorry, I'm in all black. So it's a little bit harder um, to see. The idea with this movement, however, is again, opposite arm, opposite leg at the same time while maintaining that neutral pelvis. So you're gonna bring right arm out, squeeze the glute and extend through the heel, draw in towards the belly button and then back out and then you'll switch sides. This one's a little trickier. I would suggest putting a foam roll or a stick, a PVC pipe on your back, because then if you're tilting in that pelvis, that stick's gonna fall off. So if that stick's falling off, you wanna try to just stay a little bit tighter, smoother with your extension, and that should help give you some feedback on how your form is. So the last one is a plank. There's a ton of different variations of a plank, but it's very effective, especially if you're doing it correctly. So we can do a normal plank just on our forearms. Again, if this is really challenging, it's easier if you bring your legs out as you challenge your core and start to get stronger, you'll come in a little bit more. We also have the variation of a side plank. So on your forearm, stacking the joints again, very important in all of your movements. If that's easier, bring an arm up, bring a leg up, start to play with these movements, challenge yourself as they get easier. So you can do any variations of those planks. But these are all things that, again, are really awesome and important to incorporate daily. The more you get comfortable activating these, you'll really feel a difference in your lifts, you'll feel a difference in your performance, and hopefully, again, the goal is to get stronger and faster. So if you guys have any questions for me or Amanda, this is your time to ask questions, and um, hopefully you just did some of those exercises with me and enjoy them. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. That was fantastic. Um, I see that we have one question in the chat already, so I'm going to go ahead and answer that one since it's here. Um, while I'm answering that, you guys all have the ability to unmute yourselves. So if you would like to ask an actual question um, in person, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask that after I answer this question. Um, but on the food side, it looked like how to balance nuts for a vegetarian lacto ovo athlete. Um, so Vegetarian athletes may have nuts more often. The goal of getting in nuts a few times a week, so two to three times a week, is really a minimum. Um, vegetarians can definitely eat nuts on a daily basis, maybe a couple times a day would be fine, um, but it's not gonna be their primary protein source. It's, it's a better source of a healthy fat. It's just gonna contribute a little extra protein. Um, so the dairy products, egg products, soy, edamame, beans, lentils, um, those are going to be more of the, the staple proteins I would see with most of my lacto-ovo vegetarians. And other questions on either the nutrition or the exercise side. All right, I'm gonna remind you that uh, that link to do a review of our presentation today is at the top of the chat. So if you can scroll up to the top, click on that link and make sure you do a review for us. We would highly, highly appreciate it. Um, oh, question for you, Adrian. Yeah, I see that Pam, I can send, attach a link right now to our children's hospital um, rehab pages and exercise pages. They might not have, those specific exercises, but they're going to be things that are very similar. So I'll link that in the chat here right now. All right, great. So that'll be popping up in the chat shortly, but thank you guys for coming today. Again, uh, be on the lookout. We will be distributing uh, the presentation, but again, if you have, um, if you have any trouble finding that, you can contact me, sportsnutrition at childrenscolorado.org. Um, and then Adrian's going to put that link up there for you. So I'm going to leave the, the video running just a little bit longer. But thank you guys so much for coming. Um, it was great to have you. And I hope you learned something new today. Have a good day. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, guys. I will put that video in right now. Or link in, excuse me.